we can use all the ideas of critical values in the first derivative test to actually help us graph functions more precisely as well and figure out more important points along the curve. Uh, and actually, we're going to come back and talk more about curve sketching um, next week during class time. Um, in a, it, It's really covered in, um, I believe, 3.3. Um, but we're going to focus on what's called the second derivative test and concavity uh, on Monday. Um, but anyways, uh, let, let's just look at a couple of the tips to help us graph a function. So if we were trying to graph, let, let's look at example number five. It says, let k of x be this function, 4x cubed minus 3x4. Use the steps to graph k. Well, of course, you could always just plug in numbers into k and plot the points. But essentially, the critical values will correspond to interesting points on the curves, kind of like key points, obviously, why they're called critical, that are important to know. And usually, especially once you're at the calculus level, we label all the critical points on our curves um, in general. So what it says to do is step one, find the critical values. In other words, set, it, set the derivative equal to zero or find if it's undefined, call those critical values C. Um, and let's just do that first for this example. So let's start by figuring out, well, what's the derivative of our function K? So K prime, again, we could use the power rule because we're just dealing with polynomials for right now. This would be 12x squared minus 12x cubed. Uh, and then we want to set it equal to zero to find the critical values, as always, and then try to factor this. So notice that there is a common factor of 12 and also x squared, which we could factor out from the polynomial. This would leave us with one minus x uh, as the remainder. Um, and that would be uh, our complete factorization. Um, and so this, since we have two factors that involve x, that means that we have two unique uh, zero values or two solutions to this equation. If this would be zero, remember that when x is by itself, not added or subtracted to anything, 12 does it, the end, 12 is not a zero, it doesn't make sense, but zero would be a zero of this. So our first critical value would occur at zero because 12 times zero would be zero. And then what would make this one zero is positive one. Or again, you could set this equal to zero and solve, but this would be uh, our second critical value would occur at positive one, the zeros of each of those two factors. So we can see is this curve has two unique critical values at zero and one. So that's step one. What's it, what it says to do next is evaluate f at each of those critical values. Essentially figure out where those points are because we now know where uh, when x is equal to zero and when x is equal to one, those should both correspond to critical values, but we don't know what the points are. So basically we then plug those in zero comma what and one comma what to find the critical points or the critical coordinate. So if I plug zero into the function, that's easy. That's just gonna give me zero because four times zero minus three times zero. If I plug in one, this would give me four times one minus three times one. So thankfully math is pretty easy here. Four minus three would just be one as well. And those would be my two critical points. So zero comma zero is the origin and one comma one would be right there. Um, I could also uh, figure out if those are mins and maxes by using um, the first derivative test. Uh, but basically, if I pick points in between, uh, and I could all obviously figure these sorts of things out as well. Um, but what it says step three to do is use the critical values to divide the x axis into intervals, kind of like I did up here, but in, like here I separate in two separate intervals. It actually makes a little bit of sense to just take your entire x axis uh, and plot those critical values here, zero and one. And then we want to determine whether it's changing from positive to negative in the derivatives and kind of like fill in each gap, writing where what the what is the slope in between each points so that's what step four says to do, determine in each interval if f is increasing or decreasing so it's kind of like well is it going to be decreasing or increasing on the left hand side and basically we can we can evaluate those by checking derivatives. so like for example i could check well what about at two the derivative at two would be 12 times 4 minus 12 times 8 this would be negative because we're subtracting more than we have uh, i could also say check at negative one to see this would be positive minus a triple negative would be positive, so this would be positive. Again, I'm doing this kind of fast just because all you care about the sign, uh, you care like it doesn't matter what the actual value is because we're just checking is the derivative positive or negative. 
And then in between zero and one, again, you know, we, to, we sometimes you might want to split it into fractions when both your critical values are, you know, we want to check in between zero and one to see is it increasing, decreasing here. So I'll just pick uh, one half as a random intermediate point, but you could pick whatever you want. Let's just use a calculator to check that. 12 times one half squared. Oops. I want to make sure that I'm squaring the whole fraction minus 12 times one half cubed. And that would give me 1.5 again. I don't care about the value. I just care of whether it's positive or negative. So by this uh, analysis and by the first derivative test, zero is not a relative min or max because it does not change signs. Because basically like, it should be going up, 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 up until here, increasing. And then again, increasing up until this point. And then t uh, this point at one should be a relative maximum because it's changing from increasing to decreasing. So basically I should be able to know this is a maximum and this is neither. And kind of like, again, this is not what it's gonna look like, but essentially the curve will look something like this, increasing, increasing, decreasing. Um, and if I want to actually graph it more accurately, again, that's not very good. I actually wanna graph the original points to begin with, but it gives me an essence, like a, an idea of what the shape will look like without actually going into the actual values. But I could also plug those values into the original function to see, well, what are those actual points at those locations? Negative one comma what? One half comma what? Two comma what? To see where they actually occur. And when I, if I'm doing this, I would wanna plug them into the original function. And I do care about the value because I'm trying to actually graph the original function k of x. k prime does not help me graph the values. It helps me figure out other information, increasing, decreasing, um, which I know increasing, increasing, decreasing. So uh, if I wanted to know what are the intervals of increasing, decreasing, I already know that information is increasing from negative infinity up until zero. And it's also increasing from zero to one. And then I know it's decreasing from one to infinity just because that's also part of the first derivative test. Um, but that I wasn't asked to do that, but that obviously helps me understand what the graph of this polynomial function will look like. Now, if I wanna actually graph it, I need the points. So if I plug a negative one into the original, um, I would have four times negative one would be negative four minus three times positive one. So I would have negative seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, negative one, negative seven. Of course I could use a calculator uh, and like, let's say I want to do it for one half. Let's use a calculator here. Four times one half cubed minus three times one half squared or four to the fourth power, I mean. This would give me my value one half, which would be, uh, I'll, I'll change this to decimal notation. 0 0.5 comma 0 0.3. And I can't graph it this accurately, so a lot of time, you know, we can go ahead and just round off these values. But basically, if I go halfway to the right, this should be up about 0.3. This point will be somewhere right about there. And again, I know the curve is doing something like this. It's increasing from there to there. This gives me a little bit of a better idea. Uh, and then it should switch to decreasing as well. And actually, the shape will look something more like this. Um, but again, in order to know that, we'd have to graph more points or use a calculator and zoom in to really see that. Um, but then, you know, looking at, well, what's happening at two, I would have, again, I could just change all this to two, but plug it in and see what happens, graph the point. That would be negative 16. So one, two, three, four, five. It's gonna be way down here, pretty far down, but basically it's gonna drop off very rapidly down to negative 16 by the time X gets to two. And this will be the general shape of our function. Of course, we could go ahead and check, and you could always start just by graphing it with a calculator. That's always recommended, in my opinion. If you wanna know what something looks like, just graph it and see. But the entire point of this whole chapter, or in this section, is to try to understand these things using calculus without needing to rely on a calculator. How can we figure out a lot of these traits? Uh, and using things such as the first derivative and second derivative test. And we can see we get something looking like this, which is pretty much uh, exactly what we have here.